Let's get right into uh, this morning's message. I want you to please close your eyes with me and we're going to pray together and just worship the King of Kings. Lord, well, I thank you this morning that we are gathered in your precious name. Can I just ask everyone to just stand for me, please? I thank you, Lord, that, Lord, we honor you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And as we're going to read out of your word now, I pray that you speak to us clearly that we will hear what the Spirit of God has to say to the church, and that we will abide in you, and you abide in us, and that we will bear much fruit to the glory and honor of your wonderful name. We declare this morning that we are totally dependent upon you. Without you we can do nothing, and that you will be glorified in all we do, say, and think this morning in Jesus' name. May Jesus be glorified, the Father be accepted, and the Holy Spirit be allowed to move and do as he will and he wishes in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. It is um, such a blessing to be with you this morning. Um, last week, this time, I had the privilege of actually attending the service um, in Cape Town. And that was great and blessed. And we had a wonderful time. And um, this morning, I really don't know what to entitle this morning's message. There's many titles. You know, you can give a, um, a message, a title, and it's wonderful. And it's great, and it's actually just there so that you can find the reference of what you want to say later when speaking to people. And uh, just say to them, listen, go to that message on uh, that day, and that's what it was about. But um, I put on the cross, his resurrection and his power. And uh, while I see you now, I just want to say thank you to everybody last week that um, shared testimonies, prayed. Um, uh, showing the examples of um, the righteousness of Christ being in Christ. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, because and everyone that was here just ministering last week, it was really great having you guys do that. But this morning I want to speak upon the works of God. And um, God works most wisely and most powerfully in direct opposition to human expectations. God works most wisely and most powerfully in ways directly opposite to human expectations. Did you get that? If you think about that just for a moment, the way in which God works is in direct opposition to the ways we take it as natural man that God is supposed to work. Look inside me on it. Amen. So, with that being said, the past two weeks, I've had the privilege to work where God works. Who's had the privilege in the last two weeks to work where God was working? Oh, you were thinking about that for a moment. <laughs> Are you working where God is working? Amen. Are you working with God where He's working? You don't have to go on a mission to be on work with God. You're on a mission with God every single day. So you should be supposed to be, I'm supposed to be in the will of God constantly doing the will of the Father. That's what Jesus did. He said, I don't say anything, I don't do anything. So if we're going to say that we're going to be on mission with God and, and be disciples of Jesus, we will definitely have to do what He's telling us to do. Amen. And that doesn't just happen when we go on outreach. It happens every single day. And so the last two weeks I've had the privilege, and I want to say, I want to specifically mention, make mention of the last two weeks, where God has been working, I have been working with Him. I've met hungry disciples that are eager to learn the Word of God. I've seen enslaved believers being set free. You say, can a believer be enslaved? Yes, he can. She can. They can be enslaved. They can be enslaved due to doctrines, traditions, and just stuff holding them back. I've seen mindset and traditions being challenged and changed through the way my word of God. And I can give countless testimonies of God, what God has done in my life and in the lives of so many others. But I've also had the privilege, the uncomfortable privilege, of being amongst traditional believers. that think that he or she is a okay with God. 
Um, I'm not even speaking about being in righteousness with God, being in right standing with God. I'm just speaking about people that think that they're a beggar God. They will profess with their mouths that they are believers, that they are Christians. They would open every form of gathering in the name of God, not necessarily Jesus. They would make as if God is present, but the power of the gospel ain't near to it. I've seen how totally lost people are without even knowing the truth of the lie that they now believe. There are people believing a lie that they are okay with Jesus, with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. They are okay with that, believing it. And they believe in that lie and they are on their way to hell. But they profess in Jesus. I'm standing here this morning with a heavy load. I haven't slept this weekend. I have been foul. I felt convicted. I've personally I fell in the last two weeks. I fell into trying to sort out things in the flesh rather than in the spirit of God. I came short to different occasions, saying things that I was not supposed to say, acting in manners that I'm not supposed to act in. I've been confronted in various forms in different ways the last week with all these stuff that is happening in the world and I want to confess that this morning as just knowing that I'm not perfect. So when I say these things, I'm trying to tell you, listen, God is speaking to the body of Christ, He's speaking to me. I can't come and stand here this morning and just say, God is saying this and I'm okay, but really I'm not. I've had to confess to all the above mentioned people, things that I've done wrong, sins that I've committed in the last week or two, and I've just had to say, sorry, Lord, help me. And then this morning, when I'm spending time in the presence of God, I just say once again, Lord, I surrender all. I surrender all. And the thing that I want to just say as well is, just be careful that there's a real pressure from the world. Um, be, don't be caught in manner. I heard someone say, while um, just being really in a moment, uh, they said that we work for money, provide for our families, and that's who we serve. Sure. Be careful. It's like that you into one of these streams where the focus isn't Christ Jesus anymore, and you just stripped away in the current, and you can't get out of it unless you swim to the side. And then you're going to go against what the norm is. With that being said, I want to also say that but thanks be to God who is quick to forgive, come on, Amen. slow to anger, rich in love, and has new mercy on us every single morning. Can you say amen? amen? I'm standing here this morning forgiven, free. I'm standing here this morning totally reliant on Jesus Christ and knowing that He's the author and the finisher of our faith. One of my friends in the world, he said to me, um, we were at a function and there were a lot of salads left. And he said, invite the people of the church and tell them that they're salads. Maybe they'll come. If you're just in for salads and you're not in for the meat, not even a salad will help you to come to Christ. The message this morning, like I said, has been birthed in the last two weeks. And I want to speak this morning specifically about Jesus Christ and that, we, that the way in which he does things is in total opposition to that of the world and the way we might think. In Acts 18 verse 5, if you have a Bible, please turn with me there. Acts 18 verse 5. Acts 18 verse 5. If you're there, say yeah. yeah. If you're not there yet, say whoa. But when you're there, say yeah. Okay, the wrong person has found it. Acts 18, verse 5. It says the following When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Paul was compelled by who? By the Spirit. 
Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now come on, just think about that for a moment. Paul was compelled by who? What is the first thing we need to see there? That that Spirit is in a... He's speaking about the Holy Spirit. He was compelled by the Holy Spirit and testified to who? The Jews. The chosen of God. Come on. Those who were chosen by God before the foundation of the earth to be His people, He is compelled to testify to them that Jesus is the Christ. Come on. And so this morning, there's another portion of Scripture where the Apostle Paul says that I, the love of Christ is compelling me. And the reason why I don't sleep and the reason why I struggle with the flesh and the spirit and with the world and its things and, and just manipulation and there's a new word that's constantly coming up all of a sudden. I want to say to you and I want to address this word uh, non-empathetic, empathetically, empathetically. I give you a from you. I'm going to say it like this. There is nothing in the kingdom like being politically correct. In your workplaces, people will say you need to be politically correct. I need to be correct as a kingdom citizen. I need to be kingdomly correct. I need to be kingdom, be kingdomly minded. I need to be kingdomly active. I'm an ambassador of the kingdom of God. I'm not trying to try and sort out some political agenda. The one more warrior is coming. The things of the world are escalating. I am really not worried about those things. I'm worried about Jesus Christ and Him, the crucified one, and that more people go to heaven than to hell. But unfortunately, when I read the Bible, it also says that broad is the way, and narrow is the way that finds it. Broad is the way to destruction, and narrow is the way that few people find it. I want to tell you, my eyes are opening all the more to see that there's so many people that are on their way to hell. Your friends, my friends, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're even on your way to hell. Don't think that we're justified because you're sitting here this morning. If you live in a life contrary to what the Word is telling us to do, you're not bearing fruit, and if that fruit uh, tree is not bearing fruit, the Bible says He cuts it off. I get the, I get the sword, I get my, I've got a heaviness in my spirit this morning for the lost. I've got a heaviness this morning for people that think that they have a God, but they're really not. So, so Stephen, you're a king of church now. No, I'm not. I don't know if you don't see it, but I mean, I believe you see it. I believe you see that people are really struggling to struggle up street. In the last few weeks, I've seen those. You know the salmon uh, there up in the north, where the Canadian, uh, where Canada is, and those places. The salmon will go upstream, and only the strongest will survive getting up to the pools, and where they'll, for the last time in their life, be able to birth and to lay eggs. So that that salmon may come down, the generations later, that there will still be salmon in the rivers and in the lakes. But that salmon, when reaching its end destination, you would think, crown champion of champions, salmon of the year award, all the rest that happens with it, but there's a time when they go there and they get up to that place where they are um, getting ready to spawn, and when they spawn, they die. They've given what they have, and they've gone, they've not finished. Their work on earth is done. Jesus said that we're called to be fishers of men. If we're called to be fishers of men, that means we need to be catching fish. I'm asking you, are you catching fish or are you catching men for Jesus? If you say that you're in the disciple of Jesus Christ, when was the last time you intentionally went after fishing for men? Come on. Let's get real. 
Or are we fishing after other stuff? What are we fishing after? Pleasure? Money? Are we fishing after attention? Are we fishing after pride? Are we fishing after um, what? Or are we fishing after men? Jesus said, I'll make you fishes of? He didn't say, I'll make you rich. He said, I'll make you fishes of men. He said, He didn't say, I'm going to give you a big name and give you um, high status. He said, I'll make you a fisher of men. And those who know anything about fishing know it gets terribly ugly and stinky. And when you, when you catch a fish, you need to reel it in very slowly and very nicely, otherwise, you might just lose that fish. We need to ask God so that He might give us wisdom, discernment, understanding, insight, revelation on how He wants us to catch certain fish. You might have played this video games where you try and reel in a fish, but you really can't feel it because it's just a simulation of it, not really catching a fish. Have you played those games? Who's played those games? Those are quite okay games. And it's like trying to get the, the feel of the, of the fishing. But that's just practice. That's just practice. I want to tell you the time for practice is gone. It's finished. Training session is over. We're in it for the, for the haul. We're going to go for it. It's now or never. Jesus wants us to go and catch fish for him. So Jesus and Christ. He says he went to testify to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Do you know what Jesus means? Jehovah is salvation. He went to preach to the Jews that Jehovah is salvation. The Apostle Paul went to preach that Jehovah is salvation to the Jews. And he also to preach is the Christ, the anointed one. If you don't believe that Jesus is our salvation, you will never in your life experience the anointing of God that breaks yokes in your life. Amen? You can't experience a yoke-breaking, soul-saving, miracle-working Jesus if you don't even believe in Jesus. When reading 1 Corinthians 1, the letter contains an unmatched revelation of the cross of Christ as a counter to all human boasting. I'm going to say it again. When reading the letter of 1 Corinthians, of Corinthians there it contains an unmatched revelation of the cross of Christ as a counter against all human boasting. So when you read the book of Corinthians, know this, that there's going to be man on the one side and there's going to be Jesus Christ and the gospel and the saving grace and His cross and His mercy on the other side. If there's going to be a counter, there's going to be a constant clash. Paul cites Christ as our example in all behavior in this book of Corinthians and describes the church as his body. Especially important are the powerful consequences of Christ's resurrection for the whole of creation. You can read that about in Corinthians 1 Corinthians 15. You will understand the powerful consequences of Christ's resurrection for the whole of creation. Just know this. Just think about this. If you take nothing away this morning, just take away this. That if you are a professing believer of Jesus Christ, and you have the power of God in your life, and the resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power, the Spirit's power, is in us. I want to rip my shirt open and look inside and say, Hey, wake up! His power is in me. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. So come on. You see with your eyes, you hear with your ears, and you experience with your heart. But there's a realness in the kingdom that we are forgetting and not seeing as it is. And that is that His power is in us. Amen. We can't be going with the flow. We can't be politically correct. I will be politically wrong every single time. Amen. Every single time I will be politically wrong. So for which party do you vote? Man, I quite frankly don't care for which party you vote. I care if you stand for Jesus Christ, because if He is the King of your head and your household, then you will be in alignment with His kingdom. 
parties and political parties and all the stuff and government. Jesus is there. People ask for it. Just like in the time of old, in the Old Testament, people ask for it. God said, I can govern you. I want to govern you. But you're choosing that you be governed by other people. You want kings and priests over you. I'll give it to you. Our responsibility is to pray for them. Show the example and tell them about Jesus Christ. The party I stand for is not a party, but one day there will be one great one in heaven, and that is the kingdom of kings. <laughs> and the king of kings, he is the one that's ruling in our lives. Paul makes him hear something. Just quickly say 10. Say 10. 10, 10, 10, 10. Say 10. Come on, say 10, 10. Come on, say 10, 10, 10. Say 10, 10, 10. Okay, good. Are you getting excited? Yeah. Okay, get up and say 10. Look at the neighbor, say 10. Someone in your house, say 10. You live streaming this, say 10 to somebody. Post it on there. Put on their 10. Just like 10. Okay, are we getting excited about something? I mean, we're getting excited about something. We don't even know what we're getting excited about. Yeah. You said we must. Yeah, you said we <laughs> Okay, so, 10. 10. You're going to walk out there and you will remember 10. Paul makes reference to the Lord Jesus Christ 10 times in the first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians. In this letter, in order to establish the fact that He, Jesus Christ, is the foundation of the church and the only basis for the unity and fellowship together. You're going to see now, in the first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians 1, from verse 1 to verse 10, there's 10 times the main mention of Jesus and law in the first 10 verses. Paul is trying to say, hey guys, we can't but have fellowship with one another if it isn't for Jesus Christ our Lord. So go with me. Are you ready? Are you who's excited to see this thing? Go ahead to see. It's like if somebody says there's 10 things like this, I'm like, hmm, I don't know. And then so it took me a while. It took me a while to get it. I got the one because I missed it somehow. So just so that you know, in the book of 1 Corinthians 1, there's actually 11 mentions of Jesus Christ being our Lord. 11, not 10, but for the practical implication of the 10 verses, the first 10 verses, let's just go with the 10. Are you all there? Yes. If you get it, you say 1. Okay. And if you get the second one, you say 2. I'm reading, you're screaming. Okay. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. No, I used to sleep. That was the first one. Come on. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. To the will of God and so is our brother. To the church of God which is at Corinth. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Come on, you can do better than that. Called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord and both theirs and ours. Okay, we have read which verse now? Grace to you and peace from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. And I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. That night getting there, that you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge, and even as the testimony of Christ. Yes, that's what I missed. Six, was confirmed in you. Come on. Where is that testimony of Christ confirmed? In us. It says so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must love God is faithful, no minute. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Come on. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. First ten verses, ten times made mention of Jesus Christ being our Lord, the Savior and also the Anointed One. 
Paul is making a drastic statement here, saying that if we want to live in unity and be together as family in the kingdom, we need to understand that it's all about Jesus. Did you all get that? Yeah. Who's excited that they were actually ten? Yes. <laughs> Did you learn something new this morning? Yes. Have you got something you can tell someone this morning? Yes. This week? Yes. In a month's time from now? Yes. You think this is an old message? No, the message is always new. To the one that's hearing it, do it now. Yeah. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. Go with me there, please. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. Just a few verses lower. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. To those who are bound to hell, to those who don't believe in God, it is foolishness. But to us, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is the power of God? The message of the cross. So what is the power of God in our lives? The message of the cross. I'm asking you, do you have the message of the cross in your life? Okay, good. And so it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribes? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. I thank God for the message of the cross. I'm a simple man. I do things in a simple way. I'm not the most educated. I don't have any degree. In Afrikaans, they say, I have a grad. The only grad that I get is a rich grad. And I want to buy a car for my penny. But I want to say to you, that one thing I do have a revelation about is Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. Amen. And then it goes on in verse 22. For Jews request a sign. Who requests a sign? Jesus. Come on. It's been prophesied for 700 years that there will be a son born of a virgin Mary and then you come and you'll be the Savior of the world. He'll be salvation to the Jews. And then after Paul had an encounter whose name was Saul, then he comes to Christ and then he is compelled by the Spirit to go and speak to the Jews and testify to them about Jesus being the Christ. The Jews have Jesus amongst them. The sign is in their midst. Amen. It's so in their midst that he says that the kingdom of God is at hand. He says the kingdom of God has come near. You are seeing signs. The blind are seen, the lame are walking, the dead are raised. And still you don't believe. I want to tell you if you are one of those people that are constantly seeking aura after a sign to say that if there's a sign, I will believe. You are in dangerous waters. Hallelujah. You are in dangerous waters. And then it goes on. And then it says, and Greeks seek after wisdom. They want to be intellectually stirred. And so I, I find that in in people being in troubled waters where they, they want to constantly be into trying to prove that the God is not real and that His resurrection is not real and that it's just a myth that there was a man that lived on the earth and that He, he died on the cross and that He was resurrected and that He's alive now. These people that's trying to constantly show forth. If you watch some of this stuff on TV, you constantly hear that they talk about um, evolution and Man, it's not evolution, it's revelation. Nothing is evolving. God is in this. He is it. He's the whole of creation. And so trying to be wise is just going to make you foolish. If you're in the boat, or in the river, or in the water, of constant knowledge and trying to be more clever and trying to figure out and find out who God is, you're in troubled waters. It says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block because they can't see the sign. And then it also says, 
And to the Greeks, foolishness. To the Greeks, foolishness. You're preaching a message and it's foolishness. It's too simple. It's not intellectually stimulating enough to let me believe what you're believing. It's too simple. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than man. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen things which are despised. God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. I want to tell you all the nice towers and all the nice buildings and all the nice things and all the nice cars and all the nice vehicles and planes and places and all those nice things. They will be nothing and they are still, even today, nothing in the presence of God. Amen. You can have the best phone now, but in a year's time from now, your phone will be so outdated, it's not even funny. You might have the best fiber now, but in a few months' time from now, that fiber is going to be nothing. The things, everything you can see will not go with you to heaven. Everything. Everything. I've been looking for families for like four or five years. I couldn't find ones that fit me and suit me. And today I've got families on this ladder. It's nice to get families. But as much as I like these families, they're not going to get me to heaven. You guys bought me a garment, what, six or seven years ago. It's still lasting. It's a nice watch. People even today say, hey, Stephen, that's a nice watch. Not even scratch, yes, because you bought me the best that there was in the market. You bought me one with a sapphire crystal glass. The glass cannot scratch. I've bumped this thing, I've hit this thing against bricks and places and all sorts of stuff. This thing has done thousands of kilometers with me. It's traveled overseas, it's came back. But do you know that this watch one day is going to mean nothing? Let me just take a little boy busy. You see this thing? It's nothing. One day you're going to stand bare naked in front of the presence of God. Not in your flesh. Not with any nice vehicle you're driving. One thing that I've noticed is the bigger the vehicle, the better road users react to you coming from, the, from behind. <laughs> I'm driving with a Ford Bucky. And when I come along at 120 k's an hour, <laughs> and I flash my lights, and people need to go to the left, they just do this, and they go to the left. I'm driving to Pretoria to our tunnel last week, and I go there with the go kart. I mean, it's, we call it a go kart, it's our Ford Fiesta. It's the only thing that's on our name. It's Awesome, that car. Yes, that thing is a one liter, it's got a turbo. It just goes beautiful. But you can do 160 and flash lots of people in front of you. And I just. I don't do. No, well, sometimes. But, okay. One day I'm not putting in there with my foot into heaven, trying to impress God. I will not put in there with my car or with my land cruiser, or I won't put in there with my 10 million rand house. I won't be there with the 22 million rand flat cut pot looking at the blood book strand and back down all. I'm not going to put in there with that. I'm not going to take any of that with me. I'm not going to take a tag viewer that's estimated at 27,000 rand. Uh, I'm not going to take that with me. I'm not going to take my new boat with me. It's not a boat, it's a watch. That starts at about 50,000 rand. I don't have one, I had one, but you're not going to take those things with you. 
I'm not going to take this Rolf Lorraine belt with me when I go to heaven. Yeah, it might look, 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 look nice on the outfit this morning and it's great and it's right and there's nothing wrong with it. Good is it presentable and you know, all those things. But I'm not taking that with me. Most people won't even know that it's a Rolf Lorraine. And then they think, ah, that pastor was knocking the people. That's why. And then I got it from a friend that gave me a prophecy and said to me that God will burn your loins with the word of truth as a prophetic action. That's why I'm wearing it. But I was blessed with it. It's not because I'm taking this with us because we one day. We're not taking anything with us. The gospel message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I don't know how to explain it to you, except to say to you that if you've got the message of the cross in your life, you know the power of God. Are you being fishes of me? Are you getting boring more resistance because you're a kingdom and ambassador and not trying to be politically correct? I, I tell you now, I'm not lying to you, if you're going to try to be politically correct, just know this, that it's going to become very difficult. It's going to be like a war, spirit and flesh, constantly. You're going to have a tug of war. What should I do? Who am I going to offend? Who am I not going to offend? I just want to tell you one thing. I would rather offend man than be disobedient to God. I'd rather offend man because they don't get what I'm getting in the revelation I have in Jesus Christ. And it's okay. Because they think that the stuff I'm believing is is foolishness. I'd rather take that than to be politically correct and just be going with the stream. I'd rather be one of those salmon that get up to all the waterfalls in the cold water, to get up on the top and die doing what I've been called to do than just living a life. I heard someone the other day, they said they were feeling that they, something was wrong and I can't remember even who it was that said it. And they thought, Lord, is this how I'm going to die? I don't want to die like this. I want to die in a spectacular fashion where, I, where you do something or somebody cries and kills you for the gospel's sake or, you know, I, I go down as a martyr in the kingdom. And I listen to this and I'm like, what? Wow. Most of us just don't want to think about dying at the moment, right? We just think about living. But what if all of life comes to no living for eternity? And you've lived a life that was actually empty, without God. And one day you get to heaven and you think, but but I've done all these things. My heart is heavy for the lost. And for the church. I love you all. And you too is watching. And I really pray to God that His mercy will be us on us every morning like He says it is. And that by His grace we'll be able to do and complete what He started in us. The good work. Amen. Amen. Alright, let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you this morning that we are gathered. I thank you that you're speaking to us. I thank you that the Apostle Paul made mention of the fact ten times in the first verse of 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1 to 10 that the one who we believe in is Jesus Christ, the saved and wanted one, the one that brings salvation to us. I thank you this morning, Lord, that we can just come and receive by grace and revelation all that you have given unto us. And I pray that there will be a compelling by your Spirit that we will testify about Jesus Christ to all people. May we be fishers of men and not just be spectators sitting from afar and not engaged in your will and your ways every single day in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 May God bless you. Go in the peace of God and uh, share this blessing to you as many as you